This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate. Then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the more than 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash infinity. This podcast contains explicit language, but it's probably not my fault. Don't worry, I'll talk to the other hosts. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of November 6th, 2023. On this week's show, we'll assess the life, career, and impact of the basketball coach Bobby Knight, who died last week at age 83. We'll also assess the life, career, and impact of Victor Wembanyama, who at age 19 is doing disgusting things to his NBA peers. And finally, The Athletic's Dan Robson will be here to talk about the tragic death of hockey player Adam Johnson, who was slashed in the neck by a skate blade. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Please listen and subscribe to One Year 1955. Thank you. Also in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He's the author of the books Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. Hello, Stefan. Hey, Josh. How are you? Okay. How is softball? You know, single, two doubles and a homer. Pretty flawless at short. Good weekend. (laughs) With us on the West Coast, the pride of Houston and Fort Worth, it's Joel Anderson. Joel, I've been meaning to ask, in your glory days— which continue unabated, but in your in your running back days, did you ever have a nickname? No. Uh, <laughs> my track coach called me country because um, he always said I seemed to perform better at uh, country meets <laughs> <laughs> rather than meets in the city. Um, but that was that. That's it. No nickname. Hmm. I it, just Anderson. Some of my close friends call me JD from back home. You know, my middle name is Douglas, so some some call me JD, but. That's about it. But nothing football related. Nah, nothing football. I never had a cool nickname or anything like that, unfortunately. You know, the tank or the whatever. Oh, you know what? Another nickname comes to mind and is also <laughs> from track. No, I I only had three nicknames, actually. <laughs> well, but it was nothing nothing related to football, but it was like the older guys called me Senator when I was a little boy on the track team because I would read books on the bu- <laughs> on the bus <laughs> on the bus. <laughs> To track meets, and so they called me Senator. <laughs> Your cute little sports biographies that you would read? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That You know, probably at that age, it was probably more of the Great Brain series. Do you all remember the Great oh, yeah. Brain mm-hmm. sure. series? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love that stuff, yeah. So I was probably something like that around that age. All right, Senator Country J.D. Uh, will, be, will be with us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, before you get to our first segment, I just want to say a few kind words about our Slate Plus members, who are the most discerning and attractive humans who've ever walked the earth. Without their membership, this show would not be possible. So thank you, members, for allowing us to be here every week. And we hope you enjoy your end of the arrangement, too, including exclusive bonus segments. This week, you can help uh, the senator make a momentous decision. Should he become a diehard, committed, lifelong fan of the National Football League's Mm. Houston Texans? To hear Joel and the rest of us weigh his options, uh, you've got to be in the Slate Plus family. In March 1994, before Indiana University's final home game of the men's basketball season, head coach Bobby Knight walked onto the court and recited a bit of verse. When my time on earth is gone and my activities here are past, 
I want they bury me upside down and my critics can kiss my The bleeping was not done live in the arena. Unfortunately, I was not able to find a version of that that was unbleeped. Um, But this week, Knight's time on Earth is indeed gone. He died at the age of 83. And his critics, well, at least some of them are kissing his ass. Knight won a college basketball national championship as a player at Ohio State, three more as a coach at Indiana, and led the U.S. Olympic team to a gold medal in 1984, that was the last one that the Americans won in the pre-Dream Team era. Thanks to all of that hardware, he's been celebrated as one of the greatest coaches in the history of his sport, a symbol of toughness and hard work. And thanks to a belligerent streak that too often veered into violence, he's also become synonymous with egomania and bullying. Joel, Bobby Knight transcended his sport, and really all of sports. We all grew up with this very successful, very angry man in a red sweater kind of looming over us. He was on television. He was subject of books and magazine stories. And I think we also saw him in the people who coached us, Um, you know, people who saw Bobby Knight as either someone to emulate or as a model of how not to act and what not to do. Yeah, if you grew up a basketball fan in this country, um, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, it was hard to escape uh, Bobby Knight's influence on and off the court. And uh, I think you're, you're exactly right, Josh, that Bob Knight was an archetype for so many aspiring leaders and coaches of our generation uh, and the ones that followed. And though, you know, lots of people, and I've heard this in the last few days, that, oh, you know, that, you know, Knight's particular coaching style, that, that sort of waned. People have moved on from it. I actually think it's so embedded into the culture of sport that uh, we sometimes forget that it's still there. Because, you know, every year we hear stories of athletes from professional to youth ranks um, all over this country, all over this world, accusing coaches of abuse and mistreatment. Like just this year, we've had Harvard University women's ice coach Katie Stone, uh, who was accused by 16 players of being insensitive to their mental health concerns and guilty of body shaming and making racially insensitive comments. Um, Before that, there were 27 players for the former Uh, Indiana State University women's soccer team. She was publicly accused of uh, years of psychological, verbal, and emotional abuse. And there's so many other examples. And and I should clarify that I don't place all of this blame on Knight. Like, I've read enough coaching biographies and autobiographies to know that he, too, was a part of this system that encouraged this kind of bullying that was later reframed as coaching. I mean, we know Woody Hayes, Bo Schembechler, Bill Parcells, who was actually a really good friend of Bobby Knight's. So... And and as I was thinking about that, I was like, man, why didn't John Wooden's milder, more gentle, more successful approach, why did it never really catch on? And I'm sure that if you asked Bobby Knight, he probably would accuse, you know, John Wooden of... There are people that know that John Wooden's... uh, (laughs) Some of his success was built on the sort of recruiting tactics that Bobby Knight, um, you know, famously eschewed. But the thing is, though, is if you play sports in this country, you likely had to uh, deal with an aspiring despot like Bob Knight. And you either had to convince yourself that it was okay, or you ended up hating the coach or the sport, and sometimes both. And and that's why, actually, um, I think about Neil Reed today, Reed being the former player that Knight was accused of choking at a practice in 1997. It was an incident that ultimately created the circumstances that forced Knight out of uh, Indiana. Not just accused, Joel. There's video of him choking Neil Reed. Yeah, right. There's video of it. It was a big deal in 2000. I hope you all can uh, look up that, that video and see what Bob Knight did. And it's not like Neil Reed ever made a media tour or publicly disparaged Knight, but it was clear things didn't turn out for him in quite the way he wanted. And in, in 2012, Neil Reed died of a massive massive heart attack at the age of 36. And it was such a sad, unfair ending. And I, and I just wonder how much having his name associated with that moment put a ceiling on his career and life. But um, anyway... There's a lot more Neil Reeds than there are Bobby Knights, and sports culture has to reckon with that. And, you know, Stefan, maybe people might argue that the sport is better for the Knights, um, but I think that we owe the Neil Reeds a lot more than that. I think one thing that we've come to realize is that sports are better without the Knights, even though their archetype persists. Um, you you know, you just started to run off a list of, 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 of recent examples of coaches who fall into the night school. The NFL is still populated with people like this. Our friend Nate Jackson, my former Denver Broncos buddy, wrote a piece in Defector just last week berating Josh McDaniels, who was just fired as the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, Nate relates a story where McDaniels 
cut him and then didn't tell him that he cut him. He left a message on his parents' home phone. Um, Nate encountered plenty of bullies over his career, and he has talked about them. It's, it, it is inescapable. Bob Knight's misdemeanors, or worse, began at the start of his career. I mean, the, the timelines that you read since his death, tracking each one, start in the mid-1970s when he was in his 30s. And the reason that Bob Knight was able to get away with it for so many years is because he was so successful. 32-0 and 0 in 1976, the last undefeated team in NCAA history, widely acknowledged as a tactical genius, created the idea of the motion offense, created the sort of um, idea of successful man-to-man defense, um, hailed for his ability to recruit four-star players and three-star players from Indiana and the Midwest and produce Big Ten winner after Big Ten winner. The only NBA All-Star he ever coached was Isaiah Thomas. So Bob Knight got away with what he got away with because he was so good. Yeah, people who would know give him all kinds of credit for his basketball savvy, for the motion offense that he uh, invented, which kind of ironically gave players a lot of on-court freedom to make reads and there weren't designed no plays. Yeah, no yeah, I mean, playbook. You would, if you knew nothing about Bobby Knight, you would assume that everything on the court was rigidly prescribed, but that was not the case. Um, his hard-nosed, you know, man-to-man defense that he thought, just like as an X's and O's mind, the guy, again, from people who would know in the sport, just is totally revered and given a lot of credit. But looking back through all, all this um, stuff that we've been reading, it's hard to escape the fact that with every moment of success, there was always something horrible that he did, some behavior that was excused in service of that success. You mentioned Stefan when they had the undefeated season in the 70s. He's grabbing the player by the jersey and a photo that was, you know, taken by a wire service photographer and like spread around everywhere. This wasn't like a hidden thing. There's just a photo that ran in newspapers across America of him grabbing a player and kind of tossing him. Um, In 1981, there's one of the most famous Sports Illustrated stories ever, the profile by Frank DeFord, the rabbit hunter, um, which I... I don't know if I'd ever read it in full. I, I read it this weekend, and it definitely stands the test of time as a character study and just how um, perceptive it is. There's this one run of sentences here where DeFord writes, he said, quoting Knight, how many times I got to tell you, don't fight the rabbits, because boys, if you fight the rabbits, the elephants are going to kill you. But the coach doesn't listen to himself. He's always chasing after the incidental. He's still a prodigy in search of proportion. This was 20 years before he ended up running himself, Knight did, out of um, his dream job at Indiana. But the other thing that struck me about that story, Joel, there, there is this kind of personality sketch character study that's really sharp. But then there are also these details in there of him talking to a former black player where he says, if you don't start to shape this other black player up, I'll have to get some white guys working on him. You guys, speaking of black people, don't show any leadership. You don't show any incentive since you started getting too much welfare. There's also a quote where he's talking to a woman, the Indiana women's basketball coach. He asks her, you know what a dab is? A what? A dab, D-A-B. No, what's that? It's a dumbass broad, he says, smirking. I don't know any of those, she replies, a pretty quick comeback. But he won't leave it alone. Yeah, you know one more than you think you do. This is in Sports Illustrated. This is in front of a reporter. In front of a reporter at a time when the co- and when the cover of Sports Illustrated was the showcase for all of sports, he's saying this stuff, believing and knowing that there would be no consequences, and there weren't. There weren't, Joel. I mean, so I read um, Seth Davis's great obit on Bob Knight uh, at the Athletic, and I'm sure we'll put it in the show notes. It's like an encyclopedia entry. I mean, it's like it's really comprehensive on everything. Yeah. If you ever did, it's it's a good resource if you if you want to catch up. It's unreal, and it's clear that like he'd had this in the hopper for a while, right? That you know. Um, but you mentioned quotes. He said this to the Indiana Student Newspaper in 1975, and I could not believe. I heard the one 
previously where he told Connie Chung, if rape is inevitable, you should just lay back and enjoy it. But I had not heard this. I don't like women at all. I can't bear all the small talk and the social amenities that women put you through. He said that on a college campus to the college newspaper in 1975. The Connie Chung quote was in the 80s. Like, there's every couple of years, if not more frequently, Joel, there's an opportunity for someone in charge at Indiana to say, we don't want this guy representing us. We don't want this guy leading, being the representative of our university. We don't want this guy teaching young men. So many opportunities to make that decision. One of the more bizarre stories I ever heard was the, this is, I think, right when it was in the middle of the the firestorm around Neil Reed, and he was getting fired. And they said that he went into the bathroom, came back with his pants down, and produced a piece of soiled toilet paper and said, this is what you guys are playing like. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, he was such a bizarre human. And it's amazing in retrospect that he got away with it. But maybe, it, you know, maybe not. I don't. I don't think it is, Joel. I don't think it's. I don't think it's surprising at all. Um, the pressure that Indiana presidents were under from boosters and fans to to protect and preserve Bob Knight had to have been overwhelming. I knew the guy that became president of Indiana. He was the provost at Penn when I was an undergrad, Thomas Ehrlich, and. He didn't do anything. And this was a guy that I always found to be incredibly moral and upright. Um, Bob Knight transcended everything on that campus. He was too valuable to the university and to Bloomington, a city where he was hailed for his good deeds, because there was a part of Bob Knight that was incredibly generous and kind and helpful to strangers and fans and people that reached out to him. And the university was willing to over and over and over again, overlook all of his faults until it couldn't anymore, until the culture changed. And it wasn't Neil Reed that got Bob Knight fired. Let's not forget. Neil Reed led to him getting put on like double secret probation. Unbelievable in retrospect. Yeah. (laughs) So unbelievable. And he, he survived that, that. He survived it. And warned, though, that if there were one more outburst, he he could be fired. And the outburst was probably the most mild of all of them, where he reproached an undergraduate for calling him knight in public when he saw him on the street. Yeah, it's I guess the, the thing that I want to say is um, that all of the good stuff, all of the never broken NCAA rule, really seemed to genuinely care about academics, did all of these good deeds and didn't want any publicity for them, was a brilliant basketball mind, has convinced a lot of players that he made their lives better, that they became good men because of him, that his toughness molded them into the leaders and the people that they are today, including the current Indiana coach, Mike Woodson and Isaiah Thomas, and Steve Alford, and all these people who are paying tributes to him. The thing is, you could have been all those good things without the bad things. They don't have to go together. And the thing that's so toxic and so negative that he created in our culture, in our world, is the idea that they have to go together, that you can't do the good without the yelling, without the punching, without the grabbing of necks, without the rants, without the toilet paper, that it's all of a piece. And it really doesn't have to be. And so many players became convinced of it. So many other coaches, so many fathers became convinced of it. Um, And, you know, it's telling that in his final years, he came out as and spoke at rallies for Donald Trump, um, Mm -hmm. that those men kind of saw something in each other. Uh, and like that's one of the last impressions that Bobby Knight left. You know, and it's interesting because for all of his influence, right, the, you know, I mean, if it's really hard to dislodge the idea that being an asshole is a necessary component of being a coach. Like if you, if you tweet something about a coach mistreating a player, you know, 
um, grabbing them or yelling at them, cursing them in, in, in some way that, you know, seems less like coaching, but more with the intent to humiliate the player. It won't be long before you get response saying, you guys are softer. You know, what, what's going on? These guys should wear a skirt or, you know, that, that sort of, you know, misogynistic, um, you know, a, approach to sports. But I don't understand why people don't look at how Bob Knight's second act went, like how sad it was. I actually covered one of his games when he was at Texas Tech. And it just, he's away from the place that he wanted to be. He was estranged from so many friends and coaches in the community that built him up in the, in, in, in the lat, latter half of his life. You know, he intentionally held a grudge against Indiana for doing what it had to do. It had to fire him under those circumstances. And he was still mad all these years later, passed up opportunities to go to reunions, all these other celebrations with his former players and coaches that had worked under him. And he died, like, it was sort of sad. Like, I think the first time that he showed up in Bloomington, he was 80 years old, a few years ago, for a reunion of the uh, 1980 Indiana men's basketball team. And he looked really frail and weak. And I just kept thinking, man, he really missed an opportunity. He, like, wasted a lot of time defending his previous bad behavior. It's like he never learned anything from anything that ever happened to him. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he he never said, you know what? Maybe I could have done better by that, or I could have done that. And I'm just surprised that more people, more coaches, more players that came up in that system and it endured that abuse, knew how bad it could be. I mean, this is a guy that ran off Larry Bird. He could have had Larry Bird on his team. Larry Bird signed with Indiana in 1974 and left mm-hmm. after a month. That he left so much on the table, even on the court, that it just seems that people would take a lesson from that. That like, oh, like you can have all that brilliance and still be a good person. But I think that's that's kind of the good thing about the last few days. I'm, I've been really heartened by the coverage of his death. Is that people haven't run from the fact that he's an asshole just because he's dead. We did, we just managed to talk for twenty minutes about Bob Knight and didn't mention him throwing the chair across the court <laughs> against Purdue. You and did an after ball about it. I did an after ball about that in 2014, and we didn't mention him fighting with a cop in Puerto Rico during the Pan Am games. And I did an after ball about that in 2020. I will tell everyone you should really read Eamon Brennan's essay about Bob Knight um, on his website. It is terrific. And he writes, this was the inherent contradiction. Knight demanded idealized discipline from everyone around him, but couldn't live up to that standard himself. Um, This was one of the most internally conflicted characters in American sports history, Bob Knight. Up next, Victor Wimanyama, good at basketball. There is no I in team, but there is one in Indeed. And that's the hiring platform you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful tools that find you matched candidates. With Instant Match, more than 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash hangup. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash hangup. Just go to Indeed.com slash hangup and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash hangup. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity. When your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be handling good surprises and bad ones ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there. It can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. 
Be ready with SAP. Hey there, Hang Up listeners. We wanted to share some exciting news. The Slate shop is now open. Go to shop.slate.com to browse our selection of thoroughly curated, high-quality products that support small businesses, Slate's independent journalism, and your shopping habit. From hand-poured candles and expertly crafted pasta makers to official Slate merch and beaded pickle pouches, say that five times fast, the Slate shop is your destination for unique products and fabulous gifts. That's shop.slate.com, and new customers receive 10% off their first order. Happy shopping. So there's a photo from Thursday's game between the Phoenix Suns and San Antonio Spurs that went viral almost as soon as Rob Perez, better known as Worldwide Wob, that's Wob with a W, on the site formerly known as Twitter, said it that night. It's a screenshot of Suns forward Kevin Durant and Spurs rookie center Victor Wembanyama standing next to each other during a free throw late in the fourth quarter. If you know the people involved and have seen the picture, you'll know why Perez's post took off. It shows the seven foot four Webinyama towering over Durant, who's listed at 6'11", but is generally thought to be an even seven feet. Few NBA fans have ever thought of or seen Durant overshadowed by anyone in the league. But while learning that Webinyama, the number one pick in the 2023 draft, is unlike anyone who ever preceded him in the NBA, and that there's a lot more to Webinyama than his height. The 19-year-old from France led the Spurs to consecutive wins over Durant and the Suns, an early shock to the league's assumed pecking order. Webinyama totaled 56 points, 18 rebounds, and 6 blocks in those two victories, including a 38-point performance in Thursday's win that left Durant coming up empty when searching for a comparison after the game. He's his own player, player person. He's going to create his own lane. He's much different than anybody who's ever played. And uh, you can try to compare, but... He's going to call out his own lane. Pretty big words, man. So, Josh, as a fellow tall man, have you been inspired by Webinyama's sizzling start to his NBA career? Very inspired. And it's interesting that you listed Wimby as 7'4 and Durant as 6'11, who's generally thought to be an even seven feet. Maybe Webinyama is 7'8 and Durant is 7'2. You know, it's just we saw that <laughs> Wimby looks relatively way taller than Durant, but, you know, we can calibrate things up and down however we want. Um, you know what it re- your question reminded me of is that back in the day when I was at City Paper here in D.C., I did a piece about uh, George Murison, one of the tallest players in NBA history, I think listed at 7'7", seven, 7'6". Seven, 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 seven. Maybe you can look that up while I'm talking, Stefan. And he was giving basketball lessons. So anybody in D.C. could just like give George Murison some money and he could like show you a thing or two uh, on the court. And so the premise of the piece was, you know, I'm like six, five and a half. I'm a tall guy by normal human standards. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get this guy to teach me how to be a tall basketball player. And I get get there. I like explain the premise to him. And he's like, you're not tall. You're like really short. <laughs> I'm like a foot. I'm a foot shorter than this guy. He was seven, seven, <laughs> seven, seven, two point three one meters. It was a reminder of exactly what you're saying, Joel. It's like a tall person next to George Mirasan, it's instantly reframed as a short person. Any person next to Victor Womanyama is immediately reframed as a short person. And having to do those sorts of mental gymnastics like you described with that photo is hard enough for fans. But the thing that's been so fun, Stefan, and these couple weeks is watching NBA players like Durant, like Devin Booker, have to do that recalibration in real time as they're barreling down the lane and doing things that normally, you know, against the world's greatest athletes, they've proved over years they can do. They can't do that anymore when when Victor's uh, patrolling the court. Yeah, Zach Lowe wrote the other day that Webb and Yama is a changer of minds, <laughs> the league leader in forced midair. Holy crap, I actually won't get this shot off. Is there anyone I can pass to? Yeah, he's demonstrated in like three weeks that he is the real deal, that everything that he's been hyped up for the last year since he arrived in Las Vegas for an exhibition game um, to showcase his uh, personality and his ability is all coming true really quickly. The other thing about Webb and Yama that uh, John Hollinger points out in The Athletic 
is that he is getting better at a ridiculously fast pace. Hollinger says that the uh, his rate of skill acquisition over the past 18 months has been simply phenomenal. What that might pretend for the future is downright scary. I mean, he's learned a lot since Joel said he couldn't shoot last week, so. Hey, I did not say he could not shoot. I said that he had not shot well. And he's still, <laughs> I mean, he's still not over, uh, you know, making 33% of his shots. I mean, that's not good three-point shooting. It doesn't mean he won't become that. I'm just saying that he hasn't done it yet. That's all, you know? But as we've seen, he has, he's learned a lot. And actually, I'm going back to when <laughs> I first saw him. sample size in history. <laughs> Keep going, Joel. What? I'm, the sample size is from when he played in his French pro league and every other league and shot poorly, <laughs> and he's continued to keep it up. Like he's not a good shooter. He will become one. I don't. I'm not. I, look, I was a dude that said that he may have walked into the league and been the best defensive player immediately. Which I know people don't. Defense isn't quite as fun, but um, I mean, I think that is fully why. And this is shocking to say, the Spurs have to be considered a playoff contender, right? Like they don't have. I didn't recognize anybody on their team except for Keldon Johnson. Like, it was in the course of watching that game, I was like, oh, Doug McDermott's still in the league. I thought Doug McDermott, Doug McDermott of Creighton, by the way, which you know what I think of Creighton basketball. But um, <laughs> I was just shocked that Dirk McDermott, I mean, I'm just like, but the, and this is who Webinyama beat the Suns with twice in twice in three days. And the Suns are considered, you know, one of those teams that have an outside shot at competing for a title. So it's just like when, Coach Popovich or whoever fig, you know whoever ends up coaching Webinyama you know down the road, whenever they surround him with a real supporting cast, like a bunch of dudes that really fit him, because right now like it's a, he just has a supersized lineup right now and no real distributor, you know what I'm saying no real ball handler, nothing like that, nobody that's running the offense, right? Um, but whenever they're able to figure that out, uh, man, I mean everything that we thought he could be and might do for the Spurs. It seems like it's on the table and possibly even sooner than we thought because, and I don't know if you all, you know, how much of the game you all watched against the Suns last week, both games. But if you did watch that game, it is shocking to say this. He was clearly the best player on the floor. Kevin Durant was on the floor in these two games, but he was the best player on the floor. And uh, I think Kevin Durant kind of had that moment of realization after the game too, right? It was like, well, the future is here already. In Tom Haberstrow, uh, before the season started, made an argument that seemed more ridiculous at the time than it does now, saying that um, on betting markets, Wembenyama for MVP this season was like crazily undervalued. And even now, I think he's like the 20th favorite to win MVP. Um, you know, it's obviously not likely, but if he leads the Spurs to do crazy things um then like it, make it, the playoffs it doesn't seem totally beyond the realm of of the imagination at this point but yeah i mean i think for, in the short term teams and the nba make the playoffs both because they have the talent and because they want to it's not clear that the spurs want to make the playoffs this year one of their best players if not their you know maybe their second best player devin vassell hurt his groin in one of these games who knows how long he's going to be out we don't know how many games when Benyama is going to play this year, if his body's going to hold up, if at some point and he's on a minutes restriction too, right? Like he, if you it, know. if at some point they're going to decide maybe we need to sh shut this guy down, it's been a long season and so forth. But they have um, a team that has a couple building blocks on it, a couple guys that'll be there for a while: Jeremy Sohan, um, Vassell, Keldon Johnson, Zach Collins has been playing well. But they're going to want to get another year of like a lottery pick. They're going to want more young mm -hmm. players to come up. The problem is when you have a guy this good, the normal like timeline and team building strategy can kind of quickly go out of the window if you just don't lose these games that you're supposed to lose. Unless he is on board with all of it, Josh, unless he understands that he's 19 years old, he's only getting better. Popovich has only a few more years left, um, but not one year. There's no rush here. Um, and that long term, he and the franchise are probably better served by winning 
25 games or 30 games this year. The problem is he might be too good for them. He might interrupt their plans, right, by making the Spurs too good and having them either fall out of the lottery by making the playoffs or having a low enough pick where they're not going to get somebody that will be transformative. Um, So the conversations in the front office of the Spurs, Joel, must be really interesting right now. Like, what if he's just too good? We got we to gotta shift gears here and think about trying to be a contender next year or in 25-26. Absolutely. I mean, you, you got to think that they, that timeline is being ratcheted up right now because he's much better than even they thought he was going to be. And, I mean, we have to look at the reality of the situation. Very few players of that size make it through their career without significant right. injuries. So if he's good... Now, good enough, and I mean, it's not unreasonable to say that dude's one of the, yeah. the 15 best players in the league. Like, maybe you might want to go ahead and, and, and try to, you know, get the most out of him now while you can, right? Um, and actually, I, it's funny. I, when is the last time that we've looked at a number one pick? Because now the NBA draft has changed a lot in the last generation, right? It used to be if you were a number one pick and you got drafted to a team, you were expected to contribute and make that team better immediately, right? Like you got, you know, the Akeems, the Patrick Ewings, all that sort of stuff. But I was looking at the list of number one draft picks in the NBA uh, earlier this morning, and I'm going through this list. It, I don't believe that there's been a pick since... Tim Duncan in 1997, where you looked at the dude and said, he's fundamentally going to change their fortunes this year. Not, you know, not in the future. Like LeBron was a very good rookie, rookie of the year. The Cavs clearly got better. They were really bad, obviously, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get him. But like, I don't think the, the Cavs didn't make the playoffs that year. But I'm looking at this list of number one picks, Dwight Howard, Derek Rose, Blake Griffin, Anthony Davis, I mean, Markel Fultz, DeAndre Ayton. I mean, just if you, Anthony Edwards, you, maybe Zion Williamson, like maybe he might be one of those people in there. Um, but other than that, like, I don't think you can look at, I mean, Victor might be the first number one pick in a generation to do what we expected number one picks to do. And he's 19. Like, it's not like he spent three or four years in college. Like, he's just, he's like, a, you know, a dude that's right out of high school for all intents and purposes. So, I mean, yeah, it's, um, the Spurs really got one with that one, bro. Like they, they really, <laughs> they really lucked out on that. Cause uh, I mean, to get this guy, to get you know this generational level talent, man, um, it's not fair. It's not fair that they should be able to get David Robinson, Tim Duncan, and and Victor Webanyama in in the course of my lifetime. It's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> it is cool. I say this not to rub it in. Maybe a little, maybe a little bit to rub it in. But there is obviously luck involved. It's all. It's it's mostly luck, but. There is some element here that the Spurs' success has to do with the fact that they've put infrastructure around him with the coaching staff, with the organization. But also, it sounds like dumb to say it, but like Trey Jones is like a competent veteran point guard. Um, Mm -hmm. Vassell and Johnson and Collins, they've assembled like a roster of dudes in his first year they not only are decent NBA players, but there's like a structure of the team that makes sense and is built around allowing this guy to learn and thrive and be successful. And this is the part where I kind of rub it in. You see what the Rockets have done, where they accumulate all this talent and there's nothing like who was there on the court to allow Jalen Green to develop and get him the ball right and allow him to succeed. Who was on the court to allow Jabari Smith last year to kind of, who was the veteran presence to like help set him up and make sure that they were organized and structured and teaching them how to you know run offense and play defense. They got some guys this year and Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks who are supposed to do that, but that's just like year three for some of them and year two for some of them. Like why wouldn't you invest as an organization in building that infrastructure from the beginning? Oh, no, I agree. Like, I think it's, and this is going to pain me to say this, it's better for the NBA that Webinyama went to San Antonio than Houston, because Houston is a mess. I mean, it was last year, there's this clip of John Wall talking about his time, it was an interview that he did for talking about his time in Houston, and he said that they were a mess. He said it was terrible. I'm like, bro, John Wall played for the Wizards for all of his career, and he <laughs> thought the Rockets was a, were a mess, right? So, uh, I 
I, this gets I to your agree. point about how that gets to your point about how so often number one picks go into bad situations in any sport, NFL, NBA. Um, and this is a rare case where a team with a bad record had a solid organization and infrastructure in place to allow a generational talent to succeed, it seems like. Even though this is not a really good team. I mean, the idea here was to not have Victor Wembanyama get worse and get better as much as putting this kind of talent around him could allow. We'll get to the Sixers in a second. The Sixers yeah. are a good team, but if you went there, it's just like, that's not an organization that seems particularly functional that you would want to fall into. It's like a well, combination I mean, of Darryl factors. Morey, I mean, they, they, were, they were competitive, <laughs> and Daryl Morey is a good GM. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's maybe not the same stability as the Spurs, but like, I mean, the Sixers have been a lot better than the Spurs over the past decade. You that's know what true. I'm saying? What did you think of the quote Joel, the, the the instant classic quote when Harden was introduced at his Clippers press conference after securing the trade that he wanted. I'm not a system player. I am a system. It kind of reminded me of Judge Dredd, a movie I never saw, but I didn't see the trailer where he says, I am the law. That's sort of, uh, <laughs> that's James Harden. I mean, there's, there's a world in which James Harden is fully capable and deserving of being able to talk his shit because he is that great of a player. I mean, the dude did lead the league in assists last year, right? Um, and he did have two big playoff games um, in, in in the Eastern Conference semis last year, right? But, I mean, we all know what the reality is. The dude is a mess, and he doesn't show up in the postseason. He, he's, you know, begged his way out of pretty much every professional situation he's been in, even going back to the Oklahoma City Thunder, um, so yeah, I mean, he's a system, all right. I mean, he didn't say whether there's a good one or not, though. Any team that depends on the reliability of James Harden is fooling itself. And I hate to say that because James Harden is a beloved figure in Houston, or he was at one point. Like, that dude loves the city, and the city loves him in a way that I really can't explain in a short amount of time. But like, he had an opportunity to just be forever beloved there, and he did so much for that team. He sh He played so many minutes came up big in so many, like, regular season games. The most functional era in modern Rockets history was when James Harden was there. I, I, don't, I, I don't know <laughs> if I say it. <laughs> but, I mean, it was... When, it, when I are mean, you starting, when are you starting the post, clock post on Akeem, modern? post a game, post a game, okay. post a game. Post a game, post a game. I mean, but, but if not for Chris Paul hamstring, we're talking about a team that could have won the finals a few years ago, right? Um, and so I just... I look at what James Harden said, and I just feel kind of sorry for him. Like, I was like, oh, this is delusional. Like, he doesn't have a home base. He doesn't have any stands. You know, most great players most great players have fans that will ride for you on the internet or talk you up or whatever. And Harden doesn't have that, man. He's just a, he's a mercenary. You know what I mean? And, but he's, uh, he's home now, though. He's in L.A. Few L.A. homeboys, man. That's a L, that's a L.A. all-star squad. You know what I'm saying? Howard Beck pointed out in a piece in The Ringer, Joel, James Harden has played with six definite hall of famers in their prime yeah. and left them all by choice he's reunited with one of them now russell westbrook could not wait to get the hell out of there like he really could not like i mean and, and james is his homeboy like they go back but yeah man he's a difficult dude to to play with and uh you know i mean it's just it's just the folly of the clippers man even when the clippers are good they're still the clippers well it, there's also there's definitely a fool me once shame on you aspect to harden on the clippers right now because there's a lot of ooh this could work um with these four future hall of famers on the same team but the reality may not uh turn out that way all right up next joel's gonna step away for a minute and we will have the athletics dan robson on the death of hockey player adam johnson Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. 
Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Price Picks is a skill-based, real-money daily fantasy sports game, and by far the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. With the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Price Picks' favorite players? You can now find community plays under the Promos tab of the app, to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Go to prizepicks.com slash hangup, all lowercase, and use code hangup for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash hangup. Daily fantasy sports made easy. A quick warning that our next segment contains graphic descriptions of injury as well as references to suicide. Nine days ago in Sheffield, England, former NHL player Adam Johnson died after his neck was cut by an opponent's skate during a collision. Johnson, a forward with the Nottingham Panthers of England's elite ice hockey league, played 13 games for the Pittsburgh Penguins, all of them in 2019, and also played for teams in Sweden and Germany. He was 29 years old and was originally from Hibbing, Minnesota. Joining us now is Dan Robson, a senior enterprise writer with The Athletic. He's also the co-author of A Matter of Inches, a memoir by former NHL goalie Clint Malarchuk, who survived a similar incident in 1989 when his throat was slashed by a skate in a goal mouth collision. Dan, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Let's start with Adam Johnson's death. What happened on the ice in England? You know, it's it's a collision that I've I've never actually seen happen before. I mean, we've seen injuries that involve um, skate blades with players. Um, they generally involve sort of tangle ups and and uh, and collisions against the boards and um, things that I think that are much more common. This was an open ice hit, which is what makes it quite frightening and unique, I guess, in that sense. Um, the the hit in this case, Adam Johnson's coming across the blue line, and Matt Petgrave, his opponent, is uh, is circling in for it looks like a hit, and it's unclear right now exactly what happened because um, as he kind of flies in to hit him, it looks as though he's going for a hip check, sort of an open ice hip check, um, but his skates kick up, um, and then and obviously, uh, quite tragically. Uh, strike Adam in the neck. I've never seen a play like it in, in all of hockey, and I've obviously covered hockey for years and played it my entire life. And it's one of those things that is the absolute worst case scenario in terms of a hit, and then obviously um, this 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 horrific, tragic uh, outcome um, obviously has left everybody in in hockey that that follows the game and plays the game um, incredibly shaken. It's hard to think of something more shocking, disturbing that could happen on. A field of play in any sport that we really follow. There have been deaths in other sports, um, you know, and and in hockey um, during game action, and maybe we can get to that later. But there's just something for fans, for players, I, I think just so shocking about getting cut in the neck with a skate blade. And you have had experience, obviously, with your relationship with Clint Mlarchuk. Can you just kind of put the, put it into perspective? Like, what is it about this kind of accident that you think just makes it so shocking every t- every time that it happens or has happened? I mean, I, I think it's 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 the graphic nature of it. I mean, like as you mentioned, sports are inherently dangerous at times. I mean, there have been fatalities, um, you know, and, and I think for for a variety of reasons, depending on the sport. Often, though, they're not of this kind of nature, which, you know, involves something that obviously is traumatic for people viewing and, and to, to see and, and to experience. I mean, it's, it is just, it's a, it's a gory, horrific thing. And hockey um, is a fast paced sport. It's getting faster and faster and faster over the years. And there's blades on people's feet as they play it. And so it's that kind of thing where you think, okay, like, you know, like people are on the ice, the blades are on the ice or generally, it's generally quite a safe um, space for them. And, and th- th- these events are so 
infrequent that you almost kind of forget about them. I think that's been part of the shock here is that it doesn't happen every single year. I mean, I think in hockey, it probably happens every single year, depending on, on where you are. But this this is the first time it's been fatal, for example, in in, in, um, in professional hockey. And this is something that, um, you know, it was televised, there's visuals of. And so I think it becomes um, th- just that nightmarish, uh, horrific reality that is kind of in the back of your your head when you play. I mean, I, when I played growing up, I was a goalie and it was always kind of there. I always wore a neck guard and, and I have always had this sort of fear of that vulnerable place. And, and you kind of know that it can exist, but you kind of get lost in the game and, and the adrenaline of it and forget about it. And then as nothing happens, you you kind of, subs- that, that fear kind of subsides. Um, and so I think that this is, reminds everybody how dangerous and, and how potentially lethal and, and um, you know, th- this this game can be. And you mentioned gore, and, and that's ultimately what an accident like this is. And we were reading about what happened to Clint Malarchuk in 1989 when Steve Tuttle of the St. Louis Blues and Uwe Krupp of the Buffalo Sabres crashed into the goal crease. Tuttle's skate blade, and I'm just reading from Wikipedia, hit the right front side of Malarchuk's neck, severing his carotid artery and partially cutting his jugular vein. Blood was gushing out of his neck onto the ice. Uh, Fans fainted. Two fans had heart attacks, it was reported. Players vomited on the ice. Um, It it is just a a gruesome scene. And I I think it contrasts to what happened with um, DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills last year, which was also horrific and jarring and frightening in its own way. Um, Game was suspended, just as the game in England was suspended, obviously, after the accident involving Adam Johnson. Um, It is inherent in sports, but there is something about hockey. Um, When you realize how fast they're going and what they're wearing on their feet, that makes this so much more, more visually and and just in your brain just thinking about it just so much more horrific i mean i think that's an an important point i mean obviously the demar hamlin um situation was i mean it was absolutely terrible and i i imagine traumatic for people watching but the reality too is you're you know it's surrounded by medical personnel you can't really see much um obviously later on we're watching video of it over and over and over again which i think is a component to all of this as well um and i mean so that certainly has an impact but this kind of thing is just the kind of thing that you I mean, most people hopefully would go through their life not seeing something like this, and um, it, it, it stays with people. I mean, this isn't a movie. This isn't this isn't sort of something that you see, you know, as something that's oh, it's just every day. I mean, this is something that is deeply frightening. It's the kind of thing that you know first responders see. You know, this is the stuff, and all of a sudden it's out there, and especially right now, it's in social media and video. So I mean, you're either you're in the stadium, you're watching, you can't. A, you can't get away. I mean, thankfully, they, as you said, they cleared the stadium after. But I mean, this is an incident that also happens very quickly. Like you, you don't have any warning of it. Um, and, and with Clint, it was one of those things where he's mentioned to me last week when we were chatting about this. You know, everywhere he goes, it seems like there was a million people at that game. It's interesting, and obviously there weren't that many people there. But everywhere he goes to speak about this, and he does this often, speaking about post traumatic stress. Um, people say, you know, I was at that game, and I'll never forget that game. And you know, as you mentioned, all of the effects it had on the people in the stadium. I think it also carried just forward in people's memories. There was kids there, there were parents there. They're just, they always remember this. And for years, this was, cel- it was it was really weird with Clint's. I mean, this was sort of celebrated because he survived, because they can move on. He came back to the ice 10 days later and had this sort of, you know, tough guy, heroic mentality. Um, it became something that was almost sort of glorified. It would it would be shown on, you know, ESPN and other um, highlight clips of sort of the the scariest moments in sport and and stuff like that, and you know, it became this thing that um, because the event in the end wasn't tragic in the moment um, was viewed as sort of entertainment, and and that's I think I think that's obviously changing as we're seeing some you know terrible things that have happened lately. I think obviously we're taking much more care about that. So you mentioned Clem Larcha coming back to play after ten days, which is just crazy to think about now and. When you talked to him last week and you wrote this book with him, the conversation that you guys had was just so deep and frank about um, the struggles that he's had in the years since um, with reckoning with his injury, the fact that he survived, um, the fact that he came back to play, and also the fact that when this happened or when Richard um, Zednick got hit with a skate blade, the first thing that anyone does 
who knows anything about this is Clint Malarczyk. Let's reach out to Clint Malarczyk. How does Clint Malarczyk think about this? And so what kind of effect has that had on that on this on this man who's gone through this horrifying thing? It, it, immediately when um, I heard about this incident, um, it was probably, you know, it was in the middle of the night, I think, where I was. And in the morning, I thought, you know, like right away, I thought, okay, Clint, I've got to reach out to Clint. Um, because I, I do consider him someone I'm close to now, consider that, considering that we had written a book together. And, and it was a very intimate book. I mean, it goes deep into his his world. And it's something that we spent a lot of time together on. And he had a lot of difficulty while writing it. He actually you know, relapsed from alcoholism at near the end of the process of writing the book. So I, I know how deeply the, the things that he's that he's carried since have affected him. And I also knew at the same time, I'm a member of the media. Um, I'm a journalist with The Athletic and I write stories. And when these things happen, um, we want responses and we need to get them right away. And so I kind of knew um, that, that I, you know, the call was going to come to say like, hey, can, can we chat with Clint? Can you get in touch with Clint? And I think it's something that is it's really interesting in the my perspective on it because I, I knew that he was going to be negatively uh, affected by it. So what happens the first time when the Zednik incident happened that you mentioned, um, Richard Zednik was was had a similar injury in a game in two thousand and eight, um, and Clint had been you know kind of he had been struggling in his life, but um, not to this an extent that occurred after the incident injury happened when all of a sudden. Um, all the media was calling. Everyone was asking, "Hey, what do you think about this?" How? And nobody knew at that time what he had been going through at all. So it was very much a like, "Hey, this, the narrative was he had survived, tough guy. You know, he's he's uh, he's been through this. Let's talk with him." They, they didn't know that he um, suffered from OCD, and 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 at the time he didn't even know he was suffering from post traumatic stress. But the weeks that followed the event, after he's told the story again and again and again and again. He ended up suffering from, you know, severe paranoia and um, and all kinds of um, you know, mental health issues that had been compounding over the years, but became a, a sort of excruciating and unbearable in his life and, and really derailed his, his life in, in a way that um, became quite tragic. It wasn't even that he was thinking about the incident. He was having nightmares. He'd wake up and, and sort of you know, that was deep within his, his consciousness. But just in the daily life, he was having um, experiences with paranoia in, in general life. So he didn't know what was going on. And then that October, he ended up having a suicide attempt, which he thankfully survived. Um, but this is when he realized he started to need to get help. So that experience carrying forward, um, as we wrote about just now, I just knew that this is, you know, more than a decade later, he's going to be experiencing the same things. Thankfully, he's has much more aware of, of the process of, of dealing with these mental health conditions that he has, but it was the same situation, his phone blew up with text messages from people wishing him well and hoping he's okay. And then also people asking, hey, can we comment on this? And you quote him in the story saying that it's still a big, big anxiety, he says, but I didn't go into panic mode, which I guess is a testament to the work I've done. And that's something to you should be grateful for, we should all be grateful for. One of the outcomes of uh, Adam Johnson's death, at least initially, appears to be this renewed focus on whether there's a way to prevent these kinds of injuries. Um, the Pittsburgh Penguins, where, as we, as I said, Johnson played, immediately have instructed their two minor league affiliates to start wearing neck protection and wrist protection um, as precautionary measures. You saw some NHL players, TJ Oshie of the Capitals, put on a neck guard in the game against the Islanders last week. Um, some other players wore um, neck guards or other protective kinds of uh, uh, shirts that have neck protection in them. Um, but this is something that's been discussed many times over the years, after Zednik and, and as far back as the, the 80s, after, after Malarchuk's incident. Is there a real problem? prospect now, is the technology better for this kind of protective equipment that we will start to see this become mandatory at all levels of hockey, including the NHL? It's a great question. And I think it's the one that, um, you know, looking forward, we need to keep in mind because as you said, this has happened. This isn't the first time um, an injury like this has happened. It's happened repeatedly. And this is the most tragic of those events. And so maybe this is the impetus for change. Um, but the reality is players can wear neck guards if they wanted to. There isn't a restriction on wearing neck guards, and most players don't. And so um, I, I, what I'm curious to see is, you know, I, while there's a, sort of a reaction right now, we're talking about it right now, it's in the media right now, uh, Adam Johnson's memorial is happening today. I mean, this is still something at the forefront of everyone's mind. I'm, I'm 
curious to see, you know, if we have this conversation in the new year and, and where this goes and if um, players think, you know what, okay, I'm not thinking about it as much anymore. I feel more comfortable without a neck, neck protection. Uh, and lower leagues is mandated. It's mandated for goaltenders. I mean, it's a bit of a different position, obviously, because there's pucks being shot at your neck and there's, they're, they're more padded uh, in that regard. So there's more of a, a need for that kind of protection. Um, Clint, but the te- Clint Malarczyk was wearing a neck guard, right? Clint Malarczyk, well, it, was, it was wearing a neck guard, but it was loose and it was, it was down too low. So it was, it was sort of that, that re- reality is obviously it ended up shifting and getting up under his above his neck. I mean that that's the thing about this too is it also is 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 there guaranteed protection regardless like can this actually prevent in the entirety of an injury cuz neck guards don't protect your entire neck. I mean you can't play in a brace around your neck. So um the technology has gotten better. I know there's been um patented technology about sort of t- turtleneck like light kind of shirts that are cut resistant as opposed to that sort of stiff thing. Um so I think players can play in a more comfortable way with that technology now. And I think that's great, and and I and I think that maybe we'll see an uptick in it. I, whether or not the league ends up mandating it, I don't know. I mean, that's going to be a conversation between the NHLPA and the NHL, and I think they're going to resist it to mandate anything. Um, obviously, for years, people were resistant to wearing helmets. Thankfully, now they everyone does, and it's almost ridiculous to think that they didn't wear helmets. The last player not wear helmet, wearing a helmet was in the early uh, '90s, which is kind of crazy to even think about, but because they were grandfathered in. So maybe it goes that way, where it's a grandfather situation. You can wear a neck guard if you. Um, want to if you're a veteran. All new players have to wear neck guards. You can see that being an option carrying forward. But I'm just curious to see if the conversation just kind of fades away. Um, and I, it really will require the players to decide if they want to make that change. Uh, at the end of the day, this is their um, this is their you know, their lives. This is their protection. And if there is a, a mass desire to to wear this kind of technology, then I think the league might you know and the NHLPA might push to that direction uh, maybe the NHL pushed that direction just for a liability reason and because they want to make sure that they obviously this is not good for the game so there might be a, a, a push in, in that direction too with the uh, the players association to say like we can't have something like this happen in, on live television so I can see that being the pressure and the mindset from the NHL but again I Anybody can wear these this technology right now, and it is better than it has been before. It probably could still get better, but there are ways to protect yourselves, and, and many players choose not to. I was reading about Bill Masterton, the only NHL player to die in a game, which happened in 1968. He played for the Minnesota North Stars, was not wearing a helmet, fell backwards, smacked the back of his head on the ice, had, it seems like, um, suffered from a bunch of undiagnosed concussions. This was you know, 50 plus years ago when diagnosis of concussions was not really a thing. Um, But, you know, we also, there are plenty of examples of players getting paralyzed. Travis Roy is the first one that springs to mind. And for me, um, you know, it's hard to think about whether this skate blade incident is something that is intrinsic to the game, the way that concussions and the risk of paralysis and hitting your head seem to like those are things that have been legislated um, in hockey and and should be there should be more care and it seems like you know with checking and fighting and all of these things that are just often in in professional hockey like a daily hazard of playing the sport it's kind of in a different category this is so much gorier so much more graphic so much scarier in a way but you know we're we're talking about a handful of incidents. And for me, like there's some part of me that's like, this shows that life can be dangerous, that there are things that that can happen that are horrifying um, in lots of things that we do. But is this really something that in a week or two weeks or a month that the hockey world is really going to st- stop and say, all right, we really need to stay focused on this? Or yeah, is it just going to kind of fade away and it's going to be chalked up like Zednik and like Malarczyk is like, wow, that was a crazy and horrible thing that happened. That's a great point. Um, you know, you think about how long it took for the NHL to, um, to mandate helmets and for players to decide they wanted to wear them. I mean, um, you know, that that incident is sort of hockey lore. It's like, you know, one of those like hockey trivia, who's the only player to, to die in an NHL game. And obviously it's, we're so far, we're so far removed from it that we don't think about the fact that it happened. But then, I mean, severe head injuries happened 
for decades in hockey um, and, and severe injuries. We see, I've talked to many players who, who have those, in, those effects lingering to this day because of, of the injuries they sustained in the game. But for years, the culture of hockey was, you know, this is a tough guy's sport and injuries are part of the game. This is, um, you know, this is, you, you sign up for this one you play and you're proud almost to sustain injuries. It's, it's cause it's sort of like, I mean, it's such a, I mean, uh, as a kid growing up, it was like Eric Lindros, yeah. like Sidney Crosby has had, a huge number of concussions. I mean, it's it's not something that yeah. is a, a relic well, of the past in any way. But we saw. I mean, the thing that I think that's changed that we saw Eric Lindros's career cut short because of uh, of um, of concussions, and we saw Sidney Crosby's career um, stalled for a, a you know period of time because of concussions. And so there's been a change, I think. Um, in the last two decades, that I think is kind of interesting, where there is a lot more conversation about this. Obviously, a lot more awareness about these effects, and so there is. If there is a time where I guess the culture's changed in terms of injuries, I think it's now because um, we're saying, okay, like obviously it's not good for the game to have the best players out of the game, just from a very cynical perspective. But then also from you know from a player's health perspective, from their own mindset, they don't want to be out of the game. They don't want to have these lingering effects. They know more about it now. So uh, with more education and I think uh, an internal inherent shift to the mindset of injuries are fine and we're tough, maybe there's a change where something like this changes. There has been changes to rules, as you mentioned, to try and mitigate um, the the effects of you know collisions. Obviously, issues like paralysis still remain. I mean, this is a faster game than it's ever been before. It's something that's also factored in. I mean, this is th- this game is much faster than it was in the 80s, than in the 60s, and certainly in the 40s. So this is now you know, one of the fastest games you can play at a, with with you know very strong people smashing into each other. And so they've tried their best. Obviously, though, they can't take the risk of injury out of hockey. There's just no way to play this game without taking some sort of risk, um, you know, without realizing there's going to be some sort of risk. Now, with the skate blade thing, I mean, I'm skeptical about how long this remains because I do think it has a tendency because it's rare. I mean, there has, you can look, there's incidents where there's I mean, the people have had their wrist cut, they've had um, their legs cut. I mean, so there is, some players are seeing this now, but it's not as prevalent um, that is sort of at the forefront. So when it fades, I'm skeptical that the the push to mandate you know neck guards and find some ways to get around this will change. Because at the end of the day, hockey's played with blades on your feet. I mean, that's not going to change, and, and they have to be sharp. Like this isn't this the game isn't going to stop being played the way it's played. So that you can try and protect your equipment all you want, but I think players you know realize like this is something I've been playing since I was a kid doing this. I've been taking this risk my entire life. So am I going to change that now or how do I change that now? I, I just think there's there's not a lot more that, that can happen aside from legislating neck guards and we'll see what the appetite is like, I think, as, as we stop talking about this. Dan Robson is a senior enterprise writer for The Athletic. We'll post a link to his piece about Adam Johnson's death and Clint Malarchuk. And we'll also post a link to his book, A Matter of Inches, How I Survived in the Crease and Beyond, Malarchuk's memoir about getting injured on the ice and his life after. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. And I'd like to mention that if you or someone you know is experiencing thoughts of self-harm or suicide, please reach out to the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 for immediate support and assistance. At the grocery store, you can get pecans. But don't you want bourbon pecans, sweet and spicy pecans, pecan brittle, or butter toffee pecans? If you're eager to try these, head to nuts.com to see the hundreds of different varieties of nuts they offer. I've tried the nuts.com organic dried mango, been snacking on them for the past week, and quite enjoying them, quite enjoying myself while I'm enjoying them. Nuts.com is your one-stop shop for organic dried mango or freshly roasted nuts, sweets, pantry staples like specialty flowers, and more. Their wide selection means there is something for everyone. At Nuts.com, quality is a top priority. They roast their nuts and pop their corn the same day it ships, so they reach you deliciously fresh. Satisfaction is guaranteed. Shop a la carte at any time or opt into hassle-free auto deliveries so you never run out of your favorite items. If you're already stocked up at home, they also sell directly to businesses. Right now, Nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping 
on orders of $29 or more at nuts.com slash hangup. So go check out all of the delicious options at nuts.com slash hangup. You'll receive a free gift and free shipping when you spend $29 or more. That's nuts.com slash hangup. Now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. On Sunday in Houston, the Houston Texans and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were tied at 30 with 845 left in the fourth quarter. On fourth and goal from the 11, Houston faced a decision. Go for it or with kicker Kaimi Fairburn out of the game with a quad injury, let running back Dare Agumbawale attempt a 29-yard field goal. Agumbawale is the team's emergency kicker. Head coach D'Amico Ryans sent him out, and Agumbawale drilled it. His form wasn't perfect. He needs to tighten up his approach, lean forward more, open his foot at contact, but he tucked the ball inside the left upright and about halfway up. Not bad at all. Agumbawale told reporters after the game that he had played soccer growing up in Milwaukee and didn't play football until he was a high school junior, and he did kick one field goal for that team. At the University of Wisconsin, he said, we had a kicking competition and I hit a 45-yarder. I got some power in the leg if I need to. In 2015, as a redshirt sophomore, he posted a video on Instagram of himself making a trick kick. Alas, the video is gone, but Sam Cooper of Yahoo described it at the time. Agumbawale flips the ball up with his right foot and then generates a spin with his left foot. He then takes a few steps back and drills what looks to be a 25-yard field goal with plenty of room to spare. On Sunday, a reporter told Agumbawale he was the first non-kicker or punter to make an NFL field goal since Wes Welker did it in 2004. Agumbawale replied, I might have to give these shoes to Canton. Agumbawale's sister is Arike Agumbawale, who plays for the WNBA's Dallas Wings and hit that absurd buzzer beater to win the NCAA championship for Notre Dame over Mississippi State in 2018. After Arike signed a Supermax contract with the Wings last year, Dare Zoom bombed her news conference. Let's listen. I read ah. something in high school that your brother took you to school for, for two years. Now that you're a Supermax player, any plans on paying him back for that gas money? <laughs> Not at all. No plans whatsoever. Haven't even thought about it. No? All right. I saw on Twitter, too. Um, somebody said that your, your contract now is the absolute full boat. Um, so in addition to walking bucket, you, you think full boat might be a nickname you pick up? It might. Go ahead and start it. Make a hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't my job. That's your PR job. Hey, for real. <laughs> uh, Daddy and Mommy, they watching now. Mario watching. Um, hey, though, family. We just want to say uh, congratulations, yo. It's um, it's a blessing to be older, brother. Um, see how hard you work. Um, you know, everybody, your peers already knew how good of a player you were, player you were and um, everybody knew how hard you worked. But now that you, you know what I'm saying, getting recognized in this way um, with your contract being compensated how you are, um, calling Dallas home, you know, saying these fans here love you. Um, they they really love you, especially now that I get to come come and see you play. I just see how much how much these fans love you, how much these young girls look up to you. So, um, all that you're doing for the city, all that you're doing for our family, um, for Milwaukee too, and we're just so proud of you. And I just want to say congrats. Thanks, love you. Love you too. Daria Gumbawale seems like a sweet dude. Congrats to him on kicking a field goal in the NFL, which no matter what else happens, will be the crowning achievement of his career. Josh, what's your Dare Agumbawale? Last week, a court in Berlin fined tennis player Alexander Zverev 450,000 euros and gave him what's known in the German legal system as a penalty order, all stemming from an accusation that he physically abused and damaged the health of a woman during an argument in May 2020. As Tumani Cariel wrote in The Guardian, a penalty order is utilized by a public prosecutor's office when it does not consider a trial to be necessary, such as when the case is relatively simple and there is compelling evidence in favor of the accusation. Zverev does have the right to contest this penalty order, which he has done. And here's what he said when asked about it in Paris recently. Uh, the news came out yesterday about the penalty order against you in the German yeah. courts. C can you just confirm that it is correct? You are contesting this. 
I'm going against it, yes. uh, if that's what you mean. Yeah, um, I think it's it's complete bullshit. Uh, anybody that has uh, semi semi standard IQ level knows what is, this is all about. So uh, I'm not going to comment on that, to be honest, because there's going to be a procedure still uh, to come. I think. The fact that Zverev is contesting the penalty order means there could be a public trial. So what exactly is he contesting? The allegations are coming from a woman who's both his former partner and the mother of his child. Her name is Brenda Patea, and last week she spoke out publicly for a story published in the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung, commonly known as SZ. That article spells out Patea's claim that Zverev pushed her against a wall and choked her. It was during an argument in 2020. A few days after that, she says, the tennis player proposed to her. If that allegation sounds familiar, it's because a different woman, Olga Sharapova, has made strikingly similar accusations. In pieces published in Racket Magazine and in Slate, journalist Ben Rothenberg spoke with Sharapova about her relationship with Zverev. She told Rothenberg that Zverev had covered her face with a pillow until she could no longer breathe, that on another occasion he punched her in the face, that in China in 2019, he grabbed her by the throat and pushed her against the wall of a bathroom, and that later that same year, Zverev proposed to her over FaceTime. Zverev has denied all of those allegations, though they are corroborated by contemporaneous photos and WhatsApp messages, and multiple people who Rothenberg spoke to said that Sharapova had told them about the alleged abuse at the time. These new accusations from Brenda Patea, the German newspaper SZ reports, are corroborated by two of Patea's friends, who she spoke to shortly after Zverev allegedly choked her. That story in SZ also says that Zverev offered Patea a contract in 2021 after the birth of their child. In exchange for financial support, the story says, Patea would not be allowed to speak publicly about her accusations of domestic abuse. She would also not be allowed to contact Olga Sharapova, the other woman who made abuse claims against Zverev. It appears that Patea did not sign that contract, and all of this will now be up to the German courts to adjudicate. So far, Zverev has suffered no professional repercussions for any of this. The Men's Pro Tour, the ATP, did its own investigation of Olga Sharapova's claims after the Racket and Slate articles were published. The ATP announced earlier this year that there was insufficient evidence to substantiate Sharapova's claims, and that its investigation into them was closed. Now that a German court has ruled against Zverev, will the ATP and other tennis governing bodies change their minds? I spoke to our friend John Wertheim of Sports Illustrated and Tennis Channel, and he told me that in his view, after this legal ruling in Germany, Alexander Zverev should not be playing professional tennis right now. There's an analogy, in my view, uh, to be made to doping. In tennis, the Grand Slam champion Simona Halep has been suspended since last year after testing positive for a banned substance. She's been fighting and appealing that suspension ever since, which, as of now, if the ruling stands, will keep her off the tour until 2026. But while Halep is appealing, that suspension has still stood. She's been off the court. But Zverev, who's announced his own appeal of the ruling against him in Germany, he's still competing. Next week, he'll be at one of tennis's showcase events, the year-end championship in Italy. In the past, he hasn't been asked all that many questions about the abuse claims against him. But maybe with this court ruling... And with Brenda Patea's interview, that'll change. Stefan and Joel, we've mentioned this on the show before. We've talked about it, um, the earlier allegations we've had Ben Rothenberg on the show. But um, I wanted to do this now because these allegations are new. And to be honest, I feel like they haven't gotten that much attention in the English-speaking press. And maybe that will maybe that will change. Maybe it won't. Do you think it's just because what? Because it's he's not an American athlete or an English speaking athlete? Do you think it's because it's abuse? And, you know, media outlets want to stay away from that in the first place. Like they just don't, if they don't have to grapple with it, they won't, essentially. I think that it is a pretty stark indication of tennis's lack of popularity in this country. Um, he's a top 10 player. He's was one game away from winning the US Open a few years ago. Um, Mm -hmm. he's been extremely successful at a young age and he has a major celebrity in Germany and internationally, he's internationally known, but you know, he's not Nadal. He's not Djokovic. He's not Federer. He's not, 
um, Coco Goff. He's not one of these people who commands an audience and attention outside of his sport. So I think that's a, a major factor. And I think that tennis doesn't get that much coverage outside of the Grand Slams as well. And so, you know, the number of people who know that the year-end championships are happening in Italy next week in America is not that high. It's not something that gets a lot of attention. And so I, I think that's uh, one of the main factors. And also, he's just consistently denied everything, deflected everything, said, I'm not going to speak about it anymore. And so I, I don't know, Stefan, if you have any additional thoughts or explanation, but that's what it makes sense to me. Yeah, that does make sense. And I think until, or if and until, tennis authorities take action, it will remain in the uh, sort of domain of, of, well, didn't we hear about this a couple years ago? Didn't he deny it? Uh, didn't the New York Times actually do a piece about that? I mean, people might think that this new thing is the same as the previous ac accusation mm -hmm. and not realize that it's two separate women at this point. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's just really interesting to see where leagues will, are willing to sort of draw the line, like in, in the ways they're going to police the sport, you know, where how a doping allegation is treated as opposed to, you know, a credible uh, accusation of abuse. But um, again, you understand why leagues don't want to weigh in on legal matters like that, right? Because that's it's going to be messy as it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, two, two, I mean, it's like, one, it's like you get accused of it once. It's like, Okay, like I guess we have to give the benefit of the doubt the legal system let things play out. But when I think like when you start getting multiple accusations, that's when it's like we don't know what the hell is going on here, but maybe we should uh, put a stop to it at least for a moment. Yep, he continues to deny the accusations, and we'll see. Maybe there will be a public trial, um, which would certainly bring uh, attention. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Stefan Fatsis and Joel Anderson, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty and thanks for listening. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.